All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of our Boxed Lunch Program here at the Fort Worth Community Arts Center. We are continuing on visiting with these fantastic artists that are joining us for the New Stories, New Futures exhibit taking place at the Will Rogers Memorial Center, August 20th and 21st. And today, another fantastic artist is with us, the one and only Angela Faz. How are you doing today, Angela? Hey, doing pretty good. I'm happy to be here with y'all today. Big fan well, of the box lunch, so. Yes, well, again, I, I said this off camera, you flatter me. Any fan is uh, quite exciting for me. I'm always <laughs> just uh, uh, very overwhelmed that anyone takes the time to watch these. So uh, I'm convinced it's from all of your wonderful doings, not my ramblings that have gone on for over a year now. So Angela, before we get into uh, all of this wonderful information, do you mind just taking a moment and introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do? So uh, what I, yeah, so it's hard to start where I started from, but, um, but yeah, I grew up here in Dallas and Texas. Uh, born and raised here and I am an artist and I work mostly in printmaking, uh, tactile media, but I've been shifting into more installation and I've done some uh, performance poetry work. Um, but as I see it all as an intersectional part of my practice. And like, if that wasn't enough, I also get in the mix with the city of Dallas. Like um, I work with organizing uh, Our City, Our Future, a great group of uh, non-binary women folks who are uh, trying to influence the city or influencing the city budget. Um, so we do a lot of work with the city, working with uh, city council members. And and really, I, I feel like while that's, um, it's always, it's more, I feel like it's more about changing culture and minds versus actual policy, because it really takes a lot to change policy, unless you're like on the shoehorn, like actually in city council, um, and you have some influence, but I, it's a it's a challenge for us, and it's kind of fun. Or at least I get my kicks out of you know uh, proposing, reimagining you know new futures and how we might spend our money as opposed to you know how we currently spend it. So so I do a lot of organizing work, and and that influences my uh, my practice as an artist and and how I approach the world. Um, and I think the last the last part of this practice that's like the missing or the piece of it is. Um, you know, do uh, design work. So I built a career on uh, user experience design uh, since 2012, but really I've been in design since 2002. But I was a wayward young person, you know, I uh, didn't go back to school until 10 years after I went to Booker T. But design is at the core of my practice. And so I use a lot of design thinking principles with that. So people are kind of always like, um, so you're an artist and you build apps. You know how does that even work? Um, I don't really know how it works. I just do it. <laughs> but, but so, but I use a lot of that. I think it was the design thinking or the the structure that really helped me uh, not be such of like to use a metaphor of like you see those little floaters in your eyes to be such a like a little like uh, just floating around. So it gave me some structure. So like uh, so art design and organizing is kind of like who I am. And, you know, when I'm not doing that, I'm just trying to like take a nap and, and chill out, hanging out with my dog <laughs> and cats, you know? So that's a little well, bit of me. <laughs> yeah, it sounds absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, do you use your artistic uh, experience and, uh, and I'm going to assume ability to influence through uh, imagery and the, uh, uh, artistic endeavors that you use. Do you find that valuable in trying to uh, sway opinion, so to speak, from a, a, a political standpoint? Uh, is it a benefit? Is it a hindrance? Do you find yourself uh, uh, able to work within those confines and kind of spin it to alter uh, mentality? Or do you find it a hindrance with the uh, uh, fictional, non-fictional aspects that sometimes come up in art creation? That's a really good question. Um, I feel like the when you're trying to influence or sway minds, I, I really look at it as uh, trying to find the intersection of where we might meet. And um, so it becomes more of a conversation, more of a dialogue. 
Uh, for example, if I, um, and I do a lot of research and, and also personal experience, you know, like Audre Lorde's really great quote, the personal is political. And so I feel like when I make a common ground with whatever the issue is, um, then I'm able to create the imagery that goes along with that. Um, like say, for example, when I, with our studio future, with my artwork, we were looking at a, a, the police budget. And so the way I visualize that, you know, something familiar to me is going to like the barbecue shop, right? Um, and ordering your favorite cut of brisket or chopped beef or whatever have you, if you're a vinegar or whatever, we won't get into those kinds of serious political debates, you know, but like, so I imagined it like a cop car or imagine this police car as a cut of a, a, a and I, and so I used to visual, so it's, if you imagine like the pig outline, you're like, you've got the port butt, the roast. And so with the cop car, I just ended up sectioning it off. Um, and I also try to use humor, right? Because humor, at least you make someone laugh, they're less angry with you for challenging, maybe poking the bear a little bit. So I try to use humor with that. So I sectioned it off and thought like, if I had all the money in the world and I could choose this car to visualize how we might change the budget, I, um, you know, and I, I don't do this in a vacuum. I definitely have peers, you know, and friends and, and a partner who I talk these things through. So the myth of the lone artist, I think is, I think is a myth, right? Cause you all have people. It's not just the one artist on the hill, the hermit who's like, I have the, I'm a genius. So we, we just siphoned out this car or I siphoned out this car, but you know, gave some money to mental health services, like like there's a program in, in Cahoots in Oregon called Cahoots where they send out people who are experiencing uh, mental uh, breaks. And, you know, they send out a person instead of a police officer or they send out a medical professional instead of a police officer and, you know, respond in that way or, you know, or homeless youth, you know, as, and then when I say in my intersections, like um, I had to leave the house when I was 16 because I came out as a lesbian. My parents weren't about that. And one thing that isn't really um, funded in Dallas is uh, homeless youth for, for especially for LGBT kids. So I really, when I work on things, I really take a look at my own personal experiences and try to find the common ground, AKA the barbecue or a visual that, you know, kind of in, introduces someone into something versus, you know, the shock value, right? Cause I mean, shock is, is fun. It, it is very fun, but it doesn't really, it ends the conversation usually. So while I do do that in other endeavors, you know, that will, you know, remain secret and nameless and won't take credit for those things. I um, try to, I, I, but also it keeps it interesting to create something that starts a conversation. So I don't find it as a hindrance um, for me. I think I find it as a challenge to see how I might like start a conversation with maybe someone who doesn't align and like, you know, my own family, like my brother's like a service person. He was a Navy, uh, Navy CB. So, you know, we've had some, because of the things that I make, I feel like there, we've gained some ground and I understand it's still very much a challenge, you know, people just, you know, believe what they believe. And um, I just try to like, infuse a little humor and other opinions in, in the mix and see what happens. Well, so. it, it, it sounds like a, a tactic that's working for you very well. So uh, uh, I'm curious, uh, um, as uh, uh, art in general, I know that there is uh, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, variants in terms of how people try to affect. And I find it interesting uh, that you, uh, acknowledge both uh, factions. I know some people just like to throw cold water and uh, see what response that elicits. And then again, to be led by the hand in the uh, shallow end. <laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah, that's a good analogy, yeah. Into the depths of some of those meaningful conversations. Do you find that one works better than the other or is it really just a matter of what you're trying to say and, uh, uh, what the issue at hand is. I'm assuming that both tactics have their purpose. Uh, do you feel that same way? Or is there one that you uh, uh, lean on more uh, when you're really uh, maybe under the gun for time or uh, uh, assets or uh, uh, what is your uh, uh, barometer for balancing whether you're pushing someone in 
or pulling them <laughs> through the uh, 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 no depth entry pool. <laughs> I, I love that analogy and I might use that later, I think, um, for workshops, because I, I do a lot of workshops to teach this, these tactics or these creative approaches. So thanks for that. I, um, I will credit you, of course. But, you know, I, I like to think of it as, you know, your question is like, is uh, throwing cold water versus a shallow end? And I would say that I think John Fullenweider, he said it best with, uh, say, for example, last summer with the uh, uprisings where people were in the street and people were, you know, it was like a reckoning, a racial reckoning. And that was definitely um, a big part. I feel like the cold water, you know, is definitely a big part of the changing ideas, you know? So I think it all has a time and a place. And I think it depends on which, uh, what the, it's almost like um, in design, you're, you're analyzing what's the strategy, you know, who are your, um, who are your targets, right? In target marketing, you're thinking about who needs to see this, who needs to hear it. What actions do you need at that moment? And without, because um, I don't really believe in gatekeeping information at all. Like if someone asks me to how to do something, anything that I know how to do, you know, if I know them and we're in community and I, I'll share what I know, right? So I feel like it just depends on what the action is. It's like an analysis of who needs to see this, who needs to make the action, uh, who needs to be there, and really who. It's, those are the really the top three things. So um, I think with my fine art or what I work as an artist, it's probably more in the shallow end, but I know a lot of, a shallow to middle, I would say. And, but I'm becoming a little bit more, uh, to be honest with everyone, everyone here viewing. You know, it's a, it's sort of time for being a welcoming and time for being um, in the shallow end versus time for just saying outright what, you need to say and I, but I think it's a balance of deciding when that moment is to to like elicit that response um because I know for like um yeah so that that would be how I would say that and or think or how to relay that because there are definitely different types of shows you know I was just in a show at women in their work and it just opened Friday um but I used uh I used some thoughts from or re created some pieces from thoughts from workers defense project and how and that was more of like, how do you start a conversation kind of art or how I would categorize it. And I think Aurora will be the same thing too. Uh, but I have another show that will probably be more of a cold water kind of thing, like un unapologetic, this is who I am. You know, I've been holding back, but maybe it's time not. <laughs> now, now, here's why I asked that. And, and these are one of the things that I find so interesting about art and, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, including myself, talk a lot about semantics, nomenclature, and uh, oftentimes we have words that are out there that may not necessarily mean the same thing to everybody, but very oftentimes there's a general kind of consensus as to what that means. Now, I see here on your bio that it talks about uh, you being a uh, multidisciplinary artist focusing on racial justice, and what I found interesting is it says and art disruptions. So uh, I'm curious, uh, do you consider disruptions to be a flamethrower or is it just a pebble in the pool sometimes? I myself feel that could be a disruption just in a train of thought. And I find it so interesting how you uh, uh, define your tactics to uh, uh, create influence, yet there's a very, uh, generalized term, so to speak, in your bio, disruptions. <laughs> now, uh, what is your point using those kind of um, uh, vernacular words? And what is it you're really trying to uh, uh, engage with when you use uh, uh, terms like uh, art disruptions? Yeah, it's uh, it's something uh, when I was working with OCOF or our Future, future, Christian's a uh, she's the chair of uh, the Democratic Socialists of America. And she actually was uh, helped me coin or at least like how I would describe it, because it does vary from a pebble in the pool to something that is um, outright. And I'll give two two examples um, of, of how I, I I term art disruption. So so that cop car that I mentioned, or what I call trim the fat, um, we ended up, my a creative partner, Nora, um, it's, we have a, like a, it's like, um, 
it's an angsty little art outfit that goes out at night in secret, but we, and it's, it's not angsty. I think it's righteous in its rage. Um, <laughs> but so we went out and we went to, uh, we, we pasted the trim the fat on an establishment in, Oak, in somewhere in Oak Cliff. And we, um, and so we put this thing up and it was a hand-drawn of, it was a marker version, like very simple, uh, Sharpie on paper of this idea. And so we put it up and we put up in a very like public place. And what I saw, um, what I heard the feedback, people were posting about it, like look at the came, uh, what, look what popped up in a cliff and, and a friend went by it to go check it out and see what was happening with it. And she noticed some young people, some kids, you know, kids who are just like walking around and they stopped to take a look at that piece. And they were staring at it like they were in a gallery. That's how my friend described it. Just like, what is this? Because it was so subtle, you know, it's, it made them stop to think like, why, why is this car in sections? And what does all this mean? And you know, it stayed up for a long time and it's still up. The part of on the bottom has been torn off. Um, and it has suffered a little injury, but it's still there. And it's still something that I think disrupts like a, and really just a, um, and when I teach wheat pasting classes or like I have done workshops online and, and then in person, um, it really is an art disruption in the sense of like a disruption in your day. Like if you're going on your day and you're not expecting art, because up until recently in Dallas, there wasn't a lot of murals um, happening. Right, and with the West Dallas mural project, and then the city has been getting more involved in finding artists locally, and that it's it um it's definitely was needed. So, or it's definitely needed, and you need those mental breaks. So, I also look at it as a mental break for, um, and also a difference of opinion, right? Because the narrative is usually like, no, we absolutely need all these police officers. You know, this is going to solve everything. But the reality is. Um, oh, it's not, it's not the only solution. So that's one disruption that was like a small uh, pool or you know, pebble in the pool to use that metaphor. And a bigger disruption, or I felt like something that was more, more on the uh, scalding end of the pool or the cold end of the pool, <laughs> you know, was uh, I made this, um, I used, I thought about when uh, the Trump administration, the previous administration, how, you know, how we went from a president that I felt like was some sort of a, I mean, was applying to all the rules of decorum that we've usually seen. And this new Twitter president was really a different take, right? A different kind of, I would say even probably, you know, a monster. But anyway, it's, so I would, I, but I, what I tried to do with that um, visual, or at least to think about how do I, and it was also like something that I wanted to create. you know, the uh, immigrant community, the LGBT community, uh, people who um, are low income, you know, like I grew up from a, in a low income family. I didn't realize it, but then I realized it when I went to school and all the kids had like the really nice sneakers and I had like pro spirits for Payless, but, um, but I didn't feel that. I didn't feel it too much, but so, so anyway, taking those communities felt that oppression from uh, that president. So how I visualized that, we went to a rally, um, but I had his face printed in one of his iconic faces, the faces he would make when he was making fun of someone and, uh, you know, printed it in black and white. I had it printed on a Mylar balloon and it was orange. And so on the other side, so I had his face on one side and the other side I had a, um, I prob probably shouldn't curse, but it was like white supremacy ain't bleep. Um, and so on the other side, and so, but I made a video of it and I blew up this balloon um, symbolizing the hot air of what I felt like was this administration and then uh, video puncturing it. And, and just like, almost like some of the work that I do while it has humor in it most of the time and I like this kind of tongue in cheek thing, I feel a lot of it has to do with uh, spirituality and like an exhale, a prayer and like an act of like, in Spanish, you call it brujería, you know, but in English, you know, you'd call it sort of like a witchcraft or sort of like a spell or like a, uh, a you know, something. So it is, and then just even mentioning that in a very Christian place, it's like, um, but that is who, you know, I am. Um, even mentioning that sort of 
like that kind of like practice, right? Because it is a, pra a religious practice for some of us. So I, uh, so that is definitely more on the, on the, I felt like the, you know, someone who's uh, outrightly critical is usually, you know, you don't get invited to stuff <laughs> um, <laughs> as much, you know, um, which I, but I had to do it. And, and really the response that I got was really just like, you know, I really, it felt like an exhale. And then, you know, eventually he lost and, but it was like this collective uh, exhale. So that's sort of on at least my spectrum of the range, you know, from the pool to the, the deep end, that was my version of it. But, you know, I'm young, I'm still getting started in a sense. <laughs> so um, yeah, those are two examples, I would say. Uh, how do you uh, change, how do you create visuals and change culture or express those things as far as art disruptions right. go? Now, yeah. now, this is kind of a meta question here. And uh, again, I'm, I'm always curious to hear the artist's uh, point of view on these sort of topics. So uh, uh, two, two questions. Um, when you're trying to create uh, this kind of work and it's uh, uh, released to the world, so to speak, unlike a gallery where you would come in, uh, oftentimes the art is roped off. Uh, there's a, a distance between uh, uh, the spectator and the piece itself. Now I hear you talk about uh, art disruption. Once you put those um, elements out into the world in a uh, public space, it sounds like, um, where's the emphasis on the message? Is it, is it still on the artist or is it on the person perceiving the work in that public environment? And my other question is, does the disruption of the disruption add value? You mentioned someone had altered the piece that you put in place. Mm -hmm. Is that artistic? Do you encourage <laughs> that kind of engagement? As an artist, are you excited to see people disrupting the disruption? How do you feel about that? And where's the emphasis on the message at hand, so to speak, once it leaves your uh, uh, possession. Yeah, that's uh, that's something I've thought about quite a bit. Uh, you're coming through, Jason, with like the awesome questions, like <laughs> because it's important, right? The uh, perception of it, the perception. So once I create something, I know that. Um, so I went, I did a residency in Puebla, and we talked a lot about um, the work, the work having a shadow, and what the shadow is. So I always think about. And you know, also when you put something out there, it's uh, you you have a vision of it, but you can't control how someone perceives that vision or what what the art is. And so the perception, I think, I'm comfortable with it um, morphing or or being adapted and or to see how it survived. Like that image of the car, I think I was surprised that it stayed up so long that it's still up. So that makes me feel pretty like okay. That's interesting. And I also try to approach it with like a non-bias, like uh, almost like not say Zen aspect, like a, a non-attachment is what I'll say, a non-attachment to the outcome. Of course, I want people to see it and think about it. Um, but when someone, I don't know if it, like if they ripped it at the bottom or what happened to it, it's really none of my business, I think what happened to it. <laughs> it's already out there. But it's uh, it's kind of like also like a science is a uh, experiment, you know, to see how it performs, and that's also a part of my design background. It's a, when you do when you created a website or something, you do user testing, and so in a sense, when it's out in the public space, it is being uh, it is an experiment. People are interacting with it. Or even notice but like it's I don't have an attachment to it um with that so that's one about the perception and the second question if you could remind me what the second part of it was is it is it okay to disrupt the disruption <laughs> do they yeah. get the power once the uh piece is shared do they get the yeah I think it's uh yeah you know and that, that's also it's okay, I think, if they disrupt the disruption, because it's all disruptions, and everyone has their own say. And I was with, uh, I did a wheat pacing class with uh, teenagers, which is really fun. 
Um, teenagers sort of scare me a little bit. I don't have kids myself, but I have nieces and nephews, but they, you know, they are very like, I don't know. It was, but it was very, it was still really fun. But we did talk about, we went to Fabrication Yard and it was a project with uh, Karamia Theater at the School of Yes, really good program. They, um, you know, they, they do anything from drumming to art, poetry, really cool. I wish I had something I had, had something like that growing up, but um, yeah. And so I, I was talking to them, you know, so Fabrication Yard, if those aren't familiar, someone goes to tag up a space or create some artwork and uh, it becomes, it's maybe lives there for like a day or two, maybe hours and it's painted over. Um, so I think it's also a good lesson to think about, or at least for kids and at least my practice, you know, my practice is like, I put something out there. If it gets disrupted, I'm curious to see what they put over it, what the commentary is. It's sort of like live commentary because I've definitely put up wheat paste that people have commented on and put their own spin on it. And some of it's been vulgar and some of it's been like, um, and some of it is, is funny too. Um, but what, why I bring up Katamiya Theater with the kids is that we put up our wheat paste in Fabrication Yard. And I, you know, explain to them or walk them through the process of when you put something up, you think about the space, you know, maybe you, you could put in uh, your wheat paste um, within someone else's graffiti, you know, and you kind of work it in there. Or, and then also when you put it up, know that someone will probably respond to it. And so that uh, very thing happened. My partner in the class, uh, Jody Voice Yellowfish, she was leading the school of yes and she went back later to go check out the student work and see what survived and so someone had taken so this girl her name i think is jenna but she she did like a sunrise that was pink and yellow and then had a nice sun it was beautiful like it was it could have been like a rothko interpretation and you know she pasted it up um let it go into the sphere and then someone actually spray painted around it, a graffiti artist who did their piece around it. So, and that was like, that was really cool to see. And I think Jody sent that piece to her, but, but also it's like, and I think it also implies like, what is ownership? You know, what is ownership and art can, so I, for me in my practice, I do welcome the disruption or the dialogue of my own disruption and I encourage others because I think it's a good practice of like, what is ownership? You know, what is, is that really our space to really disrupt, you know? And, you know, just because you disrupt, does that mean it's, you're kind of opening yourself up to be disrupted also. So that's kind of how I approach, approach it. And, or at least when I've done classes, I approach it with uh, kids or people, you know? It's just amazing to me. I, uh, <clears throat> I referenced back when the uh, pandemic first started, there were some uh, crochet, uh, items put up on some uh, telephone poles uh, mm -hmm. in a park where uh, we walk our dog. And now here it is 15 months later. And I remember, I say remember, I mean, again, it happened literally yesterday, uh, walking through the park and seeing the disruption of just simply time, the sun, aging, all of that, of mm -hmm. these uh, very prominent, colorful uh uh, small patchwork things that were up a year ago and what an emphasis they had in their color in the uh, uh, out of place kind of element that they uh, uh, were looking at in the uh, beauty of this park and there's these reds and oranges and all of this now here we are a year later and they are literally hanging on by a thread <laughs> as the pandemic continues to creep around our feet. Right. And I wonder if they don't have more emphasis in my mind <laughs> today <laughs> from the aging and the fact that, you know, we all want to put these things behind us, but yet they are still there. And as uh, uh, haggard and altered as I think all of us may be at this point. So, so that's why I asked that because it totally has a different messaging to me today than it did a year ago mm -hmm. and yet I don't believe any artist or artistry has been uh, accented on that piece other than just simply the disruption of time and yet it seems so relevant if not even more so that they're still up and uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, still continue to have that effect on me personally anyway. And I look at him almost every time I walk through there and it's just amazing how it mirrors the uh, uh, temperature of the uh, uh, world these days. So, so I'm always curious because um, I know oftentimes when something like that goes up in a, a public place, uh, I, I'm always uh, wondering if the artist has to, with uh, uh, intent, sever the tie to the piece and just let it be, or if they hang on to those sort of messages as well. And so it's always so interesting to uh, hear an artist's take on what and how they uh, release their art into the world. So uh, I'll be curious to uh, touch base with you later on and see if it's still there and uh, what has uh, adjusted in its uh, lineage there on the walls. So uh, right. keep up, please. <laughs> we Absolutely. need more disruption, I believe. So, <laughs> so, um, so Angela, do you mind talking a little bit about how you uh, uh, came to be a part of this uh, uh, new Stories, New Futures exhibit over here in Fort Worth? Yeah, that's um, a really exciting project that I, uh, I can't wait to, it's it's August 20th, 21st, Friday and Saturday. You have to get a time slot yes. um, to see it. Uh, so I got uh, introduced to it from uh, Dr. Lauren Cross, a big fan of her work um, as a curator and just as a person. But she uh, it asked me one day uh, and said if she was was curating the show with interactive art and I've done some projections um, and mostly animated uh, mostly gifts of my work of prints I've done some of prints and some of uh, like photography where I kind of created a collage out of some work out of West Dallas that I was working on um, but yeah she so it was she's really great to work with she is really great to work with and also with uh, Erica Felicella I knew of her through, I used to work with art conspiracy back in the way, way back times. And that's kind of what was my uh, introduction to Erica. So she's also running the tech for Aurora. And so it's been really cool to learn from her um, how we should um, think about projectors and, and how sound might play and just uh, creating a site specific work. So I'm really excited to share what I have uh, for Aurora and I'm using printmaking. And also um, I do a lot of history, like. I wouldn't say I was a historian, but kind of aspiring historian maybe, but I've been learning with my practice. I've been working with uh, Dallas and how it came to be from when it's when it was a uh, settler state to now. Um, so uh, I've been working with uh, the history of the river. So what we'll see is a lot of uh, stories from the river in a printmaking style of animation. And so I'll have two different walls um, set up and yeah, I'm really excited to share without giving away too much, right. you know, <laughs> I'll keep going. I had to stop myself. I'm like, that's, now, yeah. Angela, and you can shut me down if you want. I agree. I don't want to give any spoilers away. Now, it's my understanding this is an extension of a piece that you've worked on before. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So, so if that piece was already out, are we giving too much away by uh, uh, talking about where that was and how that one came to fruition? No, I don't think we give give too much away. I think we can we can keep going with that because it, it fits. This is just another the Aurora project and Fort Worth Community, Fort Worth Arts Council project will be a different facet. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you the, or, the origin story of that is uh, or the that piece is is called the Arcacosa. Um, so that was the name of the river historically. Whenever um, Alfonso de Leon. and it's actually been named several times from what I learned. Um, but that project came about with. I was asked by Teatro Dallas, who's a really good theater company in Dallas, um, and they're big supporters of me, and I've always loved supporting their work because I just love theater, too. It's like a nice one. One of the things in the pandemic I missed, one was the movies and also uh, go to the theater and then going to theater, but Teatro Dallas. But um, so, yeah, I so they asked me to be in this project called New Monuments. And that's really what started this, this work was, um, you know, how do we think about monuments? How do we memorialize something? And I had been working with uh, Jerry Hawkins and uh, Brian Larney with uh, Dallas Truth and Healing Reconciliation, D-A-T-H-R-T or something. Um, and they were, and so I wanted to do something 
that was uh, so I wanted to when I read when I read a uh, TRT's uh, I think it was their kind of like a PDF kind of a report it was in it like a report about Dallas and where it stood in racial equity and one of the things that I learned was about the river being called the Arcosa and so that started as a researcher in my design process you know I'm always looking up articles and researching before I actually even get into the art making process so I learned that it was um, named a few different names from different um, people I was called the river of canoes at one point it was called the Arcosa that you know eventually what starts off as Erica Coast in North Texas and it funnels out to the Houston area which I didn't know how far it traveled and I just feel so bad for those people because I mean the Trinity River is considered septic you know it's like I feel bad for those downstream folks you know oh, yeah. Um, so yeah so I um I was thinking so I wanted to just rename the river or reclaim reclaim the river not rename it but but that's the thing, what, what made me, uh, what was really excited about this project, Reclaiming the River, meant that we're putting light on a history of this river. And also in comparison to, say, in Fort Worth, you can, you can paddle that river and not worry about, you know, coming out with three eyes, you know, to use a simple Simpsons reference, Blinky. You know, you can, you can go down that river and enjoy it and kayak. The Trinity, you can kayak. You really hope to pray you don't fall in. Right. Um, but just, you know, highlighting those differences. Why is that different? You know, um, also thinking about uh, the communities that live around the river. You know, how do they engage with the river? Do they engage the river? They don't. Um, maybe they might fish. There's carp, you know, they might fish there. Um, so really, so part of reclaiming the river is kind of asking these questions of why. Also, when we think about, I with the intersectionality of it, I think about um, with uh, the earth and where it is right now. And, you know, the fact that it was, uh, the river was moved, you know, a lot of people aren't aware that the river was moved. I mean, if you're of a certain age, you kind of know, but, and there was a big plan to move it. And all the, the silly things that have been proposed with that river, you know, from ferry transportation, that wasn't so silly, but the toll road, toll road in the Trinity was very ridiculous, I think. So it's uh, the Trinity has, or the Arcosa has a lot of different uh, avenues for conversation. You know, how do we, well, how do we get to rename a river? Who renames it? Who claims it? And also, so with that work, you know, I worked with Brian and Jerry, the Arcosa project. We eventually um, influenced, or at least started, there was a city council member, Omar, actually did start a coalition to rename the Arcosa. Um, and that's in progress, you know, the pandemic sort of slowed that, um, you know, that progress, but I think it's just the audacity to want to rename or reclaim something that was the project, you know, or, or to work with community members, because like I said, it's not really a solo person project, you know, it's a, it was more of an idea. So with my new work with Aurora, I'm, I am uh, illustrating what that might look like or the, what the river remembers. And so kind of tagging on to that um, initial message. So I'm really excited to, to yeah, show it. Absolutely. Now I bring that up because that's also part of your uh, bio slash mission, I would guess, is uh, uh, the uh, reclamation of public spaces. So uh, it's nice to see how that is uh, working in practice. And uh, uh, I, I find it so interesting. Uh, I have really... Uh, been made aware of my ignorance over the last year of the things that I thought I knew, uh, the things that I uh, really just had no clue about. And so uh, it, it's been really quite uh, an epiphany for me uh, to be able to speak to uh, all of these fabulous artists over the last year and, uh, and just really getting my mind around how little I know. <laughs> and so. <laughs> So I thank you for that, uh, uh, personally and professionally. And uh, you know, again, when people start talking about semantics and the nomenclature of verbiage, and they, you know, see statements like uh, reclamation of public space, and you think that a whole army is going to come in, and it's really not all about that. It really is oftentimes just information, education, and an opportunity for us to just simply learn something 
about these uh, uh, wonderful areas that are around us. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, even the uh, building over here at the uh, Will Rogers is another uh, wonderful opportunity for uh, all of these artists to reclaim that space. And there are 10, I believe, at the base of the Will Rogers and then Aurora lighting up the tower. Angela, what is it you hope comes from this uh, engagement with these artists? What message are you hoping is uh, conveyed for the people that are able to come and uh, see this fantastic art exhibit? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dr. Lauren Cross, she put together a really great roster of artists that are coming from, you know, the It's New Stories, New Visions um, is the, the theme. And I feel like every artist is coming at it with uh, their own personal story and um, also their own personal experience. And so I hope that, you know, those those stories come across in a way that uh, opens, I mean, or just kind of raises awareness and opens their their people's minds. So what good art should do is like engage and and, infl and uh, cause people to think. So for me, I think it's, uh, I want to show something that is, I don't know, I, I also want to focus on the beauty of the river and also, but also tell the story of the river. So I want them to come away with a new understanding of, of that and also maybe action, you know, like part of my practice has always been, I highlight a, I highlight this issue or something I care about. And then I pair it with real people who are doing the actual work in, in that area. And so one of the things with the river, you know, there is a coalition to reclaim it, rename it. Um, but also like, what do we, how do we maybe glean some of the ancient uh, ways that we, you know, navigated the river or took care of the river. You know, it's part of reclamation, I think, is that. So I'd want those things to kind of be a part of the conversation um, and, you know, tied into other aspects like uh, with Brian Larney's work and Jody Voice Yellowfish, you know, she has an MMIW thing about um, with uh, uh, women. Um, and, you know, just the, I, I see there's a lot of intersectionality in the river. So I'd want, I'd want those things to come through and maybe some action, you know, maybe we clean up the river. I don't know. Maybe we rename it. Maybe we like, uh, uh, it's not impossible. Um, I think with the design, a lot of times we can, we, we can get a chicken sandwich to your house, like within minutes, but we can't use design to solve the river or, you know, clean the river or, you know, deliver like accurate, you know, um, services to people, you know. So that's kind of what I'd like to take away is, you know, how do you reimagine how we use the tools that we have and how do we look at landmarks or how do we look at spaces, you know. So I think those are some of the things I'd say for that. It, it, it sounds absolutely amazing. And uh, speaking of chicken sandwiches, uh, this, this is called box lunch and here I just delved right into it. I know that we... Uh, did a little pre-prep today, so uh, we don't have to worry about uh, uh, cooking things at all. So I would be remiss if I did not ask, what is on your lunch menu today? Yeah, so I, I um, yeah, I, I love talking. I can just talk about art all day for sure. And, but I do love to eat um, a lot. And uh, usually I have a smoothie and uh, for, lunch, for breakfast and then for lunch, I have like something, but I made an egg sandwich today, a fried egg sandwich, the humble tried and true egg sandwich with mayo. Um, I use uh, Tillamook cheese because that's my favorite. I lived in Oregon for a little wow. bit and they have the best cheese. Um, yeah, some little lettuce and tomato to put on there. A little, um, yeah, and so maybe I'll have a side of fruit that's not pictured, not seen on television here or seen well, on the webs. <laughs> I, I have to say that that plate looks artistic just in itself. I, I don't know if I've seen such a beautiful yellow yolk on an egg. Is that the cheese <laughs> melted on top of that? It's definitely the cheese. The oh, uh, well, it looks just literally picturesque. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, and it, it's, it comes with a brioche bun. You know, yeah, that's what happens when you a sandwich. <laughs> I, tr I tried, you know, my mom always said you should, uh, you eat with your eyes too, so it should look nice. Well, you know? <laughs> welcome to that. <laughs> I see you that's have what happens, That's what happens when a production manager makes a lunch. They just throw it all together, shake it up, and that's that. I'm going to give a shout out to Hawaiian Brothers today. 
So mm -hmm. they have finally made their way down to the south. Uh, they have some wonderful chicken, some pork, rice. They have a great macaroni salad as well. I know there's one in Hearst, so I had some this weekend. And so I am uh, enjoying the leftovers from that. I'll so, have to try that. Angela, as we wrap up our uh, interview here and move on to our lunch, how and where can people find you and your art and keep up with all of the wonderful things that you've got going on? Yeah, so you, people can keep up with me at uh, my website, angelafaz.com. It's pretty simple. Um, and then uh, Instagram. So I'll be taking over uh, this Friday. I'll be taking over the uh, Fort Worth, uh, or maybe it's the Aurora account. My, I'm sorry, the Aurora account. And we'll I'll be sharing some sneak peek images of some of the, the river work I talked about. So uh, that would be at Aurora on Instagram and the Fantastic on Instagram. Nice. And say that one more time. For yours, the Fantastic. So it's just wow. my last name, the Fantastic. Perfect. We'll get some links down in the comments as well, so that people can go check that out too. So I just want to remind everybody that coming August twentieth and twenty-first, the Arts Council of Fort Worth and Aurora are presenting a public exhibition curated by Dr. Lauren Cross, featuring all of these fantastic artists as well at the base and the tower. It is absolutely free. All you need to do is uh, head to the website. You can sign up for a time. They'll send you a little ticket back to you as well. And uh, the event takes place again, August 20th, 21st, 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Makes it a lot easier to see all of the wonderful projections as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe you can find that at newstoriesnewfutures.org. So go there and sign up for a time as well and come join us August 20th and 21st, see all the wonderful art that these fabulous creators are bringing over here to Fort Worth. Angela, any words of wisdom or any even practical advice for our audience out there watching as we wrap things up? <laughs> yeah, I think, um... I would just say, you know, I really want to thank you, Jason, for the time. It's been a really, it's been a pleasure. And I would just say for, uh, yeah, for some of those artists out there who are afraid to push buttons, you know, don't be afraid to, to uh, put something out there and let it go or, or try some experiments. Uh, but it, I mean, other than that, I don't really have any words of wisdom. <laughs> well, just I you gave us quite a bit in the interview, it sounded like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I just recommend naps. I think, you know, I'll probably eat my breakfast and maybe, uh, or maybe my, uh, my food here and maybe, but I've been trying to take naps. So also highly recommend those. Well, that is the best <laughs> wisdom I think I've heard in the last year and a half is uh, take a nap, everyone. Just <laughs> go take a nap. You'll be right. fine when you wake up. You'll feel right a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Angela, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, uh, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time. This is where we uh, lift our uh, plates and we will sign off. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back next Monday with a brand new box lunch. Bon appetit, everyone. Angela, have a wonderful day. Keep up the great work. I'll see you hopefully in Thank person uh, very, very soon. Take care, everybody. We'll see Bye. you again real soon. Bye-bye.